Most of you have probably heard of Isaac Asimov, uh, an extraordinary science fiction writer, also an extraordinary writer of science and mathematics. Uh, he wrote more than 250 books. And this is mind-boggling. Uh, and I actually carried on some correspondence with him a long time ago about prime numbers. And I remember once being in New York City uh, and walking down the street and there was a little restaurant I could see inside and there was Asimov sitting at the table. And he was very distinctive. If you look a picture of his black and gray hair and bushy sideburns, he was unmistakable, Asimov. Uh, and there's one thing that he said that really, I think, applies so profoundly and broadly that we can use it as a lens today as we look into what it is to be mishpacha. What is it to be body of Christ? What is it to be community? What, it is, what is it to be godly friends of one another? And what Asimov said was, intelligence is no bar to stupidity. Intelligence is no bar to stupidity. The, the idea being, doesn't matter how smart you are, you can still say and do stupid things. And he's spot on about that, of course. So I'm, I want to, with this little bit in mind, consider the grace of God in giving us each individually who we are, people made in his image, but also individual gifts, not all the same, but broadly distributed and different. And what it is that we must do each of us in keeping that body of Christ healthy so that the, the sinews and the neurons and the muscles and the bones and all of the connections of that metaphor are actually lived out in a healthy way. And you know, Paul talks about how one part of the body can't say that it's another part or complain that it isn't. Well, that's sort of a, yeah, of course. But in that, as we live it out as the body of Christ, we somehow find ways to be both jealous of one another and unhappy with one another on things that should not divide us, but we let them. Somehow we don't let any possible offense go unexercised. <laughs> and as Rebecca just said, that's how you learn. Except that often it isn't how we learn because we take the offense and use it as a reason to part. Whether that's done in intellectually, which Asimov would say, well, that was stupid. <laughs> or literally, that we just depart from one another. And, and I won't, I have a couple of things here that I want to talk about that I or we have experienced over the course of many years of being together, but they sort of illustrate something that each of us has a tendency toward that must be recognized and resisted. We had one person come and become a part of this community for a while. And if you have been here for a while, you know that, A, this is an unusual place, <laughs> filled with unusual people. That would be all, plus, plus this one. and that we're crazy about each other, and that we really do endeavor 
to overlook areas of disagreement because the essence of what God is doing here is relationship, not conformity to a specific list of doctrinal propositions. Now, I always have to say after I've said that, I don't mean anything's okay. You can believe anything you want, and that's fine. That's not what I've said. But at the same time, I seriously doubt if there isn't something on which each and every one of us disagrees with each and every one of us. Welcome to the world. Welcome to human beings. One individual I'm remembering just by way of example here was learning what it meant to be a part of this community, learning to know other folks in it, um, sort of working their way in to be uh, a beloved and effective part of Mishpocha, of our community, and then discovered that one of the books that we were studying, the author of that book, had a particular view on the meaning of Romans 7 that differed from this person's interpretation of Romans 7. And so this person isn't here anymore. I, I just, I share this to say, think about this. You know when Jesus says, uh, before you tell someone else to take the speck out of their eye, get the log out of your eye? The last two days, I've had some kind of little speck in my eye. I don't know if it's a grain of sand or what. An eyelash, been putting eye drops in, looking to see what it is. Whatever that tiny little thing is that I can't see has really garnered a lot of my attention over the last two days. I might even have to go to convenient care and have them look because I haven't been able to solve it. I think each of us sometimes is at risk of some tiny little thing that someone else has becoming a really big deal for us, and so I just can't be here anymore. Or I just, you know, maybe I'll talk to the others, but I ain't talking to you, talk to the hands. Not, I'm not doing that anymore. And my point here is this. Both our personal gifts, which in Scripture we are taught are actually for each other, and the gift of this family, this gift of this community, require significant unrelenting nurture. They need to be fed with living water. They need to be fertilized with the scriptures that help us grow. And the weeds need to come out by repentance the weeds that would overcome the real valuable growth. It's like a garden or a farm to grow together. And it doesn't just happen by coasting through it. It requires genuine, hard, interpersonal work. And there will be times when any of us come into conflict with each other. And, and when we do, the choice we have is lean in, wrestle through it, and come out the other side more deeply in love, or say, the heck with you, I've had it. Because of that little grain that I've allowed to irritate me so much.
This body of Christ is complex. Relationships in it are complex. You don't coast and have a healthy garden. You don't simply sit back with your feet up and have a healthy farm. I remember, and I may have shared this, uh, a sermon given by an imam in Egypt to his congregation. I'm sure this didn't make him popular because what he said was this, you look over the border into Israel and you see a, guard, uh, a desert which has become a garden with vegetation and crops and plants and it is lush and you think it should be yours. But then you go to the cafe and you smoke your cigarettes and drink your coffee and you do nothing. They have done backbreaking work to turn the desert so that it would bloom. You didn't do that. Over hundreds of years, you didn't do that. You sat here and drank coffee and smoked cigarettes. But now, because they've done it, you think it should be yours. Those are not my words. <laughs> Those are the words of an imam to his congregation. And he basically said, you want to make the desert bloom, you get to work. And, and that's true for all of us, particularly followers of Yeshua, of Jesus. This is the body of Christ. This is the garden. This is the farm, if you would. And just as a farm and just as a garden and just as a congregation, a mishpocha, requires not sitting back and hoping it's all going to happen on its own. So it is with us. There will be challenges. There will be weeds. There will be, I don't know, deer who come in and eat all the flowers off of your roses. I speak from personal experience. It happens. But we have to be committed to each other loving each other, lovers of each other in the best possible sense. When we were in uh, Baltimore, a young woman uh, came up, and they have an opportunity that they give like we do here uh, for testimony or words or whatever. Uh, and they come up, and some of them are then given the invitation to share the word they heard with all of those who were present. And this young woman came up and said, I think the Lord wants us to know that it's okay to say I love you to each other, including to members of the opposite sex. And realize that what it really means is, wait for it, I love you. <laughs> no other implications. I love you. There isn't a person in this room or watching us that we know that I'm not crazy about. I'm just stunned at the brilliance of variety of the master artist and the people that he's made. There isn't a single person here like me at all, thank God. <laughs> and not because I'm something that nobody wants, but because I'm different from you. And I thank God for that because it means I have you who are different from me. And I grow from you and from my interactions with you. I read a quote from someone who said, I, I used to think as a pastor that it was really important that we have accountability groups where we held each other accountable for our walk. And he said, I later realized that wasn't what I had hoped it would be because I got scared that if in the last week I hadn't lived up to what I said I was going to do or I'd fallen in some way, 
that then I had to go and disclose it to my accountability group. And although they would pray with me or forgive me or offer counsel, I just didn't want to go. I didn't want to be that vulnerable or that exposed. It just, it was just way too hard. Well, I think accountability is actually a good thing. But the way it works best is when the people you are accountable to can look at you and honestly say, I love you. I mean, think about your kids. If you've had kids or nieces or nephews or, or good friends to whom you might have been uh, mentor or with some life lessons or wisdom. If your child or your friend does something wrong, you don't say what you did was okay, don't worry about it. You make it clear why it was wrong what to do differently going forward, which by the way, as an aside here, is what the word repent literally means in the Greek. It means to change your mind. The idea is, this I thought was a good path. This I thought was a good plan. I repented, and I chose this path instead. Repent means to change your mind, to choose a different path going forward. And so if you do something that's wrong, the confession of it, the admitting of it, is actually a very healing, productive moment because it gets you off of the destructive path and God willing, which he is, onto a productive path going forward. And sometimes it's a little wrenching to do that, to have to admit that you were wrong. Ugh. but not recognizing that the way you're doing things or the path that you're on is wrong means that you're stuck there. You want to be stuck there, really? I had an encounter with some folks in this last week. I won't, won't disclose who. You don't, don't necessarily know them. But they had found themselves uh, in a situation where something was amiss. They didn't actually know the reason it was amiss, but it was amiss. And so what they did in the public square, let's say, lots of other people standing around, was they began to complain loudly and insultingly toward those they thought might be responsible but didn't actually know and made a big scene. How much do you suppose that contributed toward the solving of the problem? I can tell you, not one bit, zero, okay? Now, last night, we're at Portillo's, and I had ordered a slab of ribs for my family. The four of us went out to dinner. And because that takes 20 minutes, I ordered it on the phone, on the way there. And the woman that, from Portillo's that was on the phone that took my order said, it'll be ready for you in about 20 minutes when you come into the restaurant, go over to the um, takeout shelves, and it will be on that shelf for you. So we got there and waited and waited and waited. It's just not appearing on these shelves. It's not there. So I went up and looked once again. None of the things there are it. There are some other shelves over here. One says delivery. The other says DoorDash and Grubhub and so on. Shelves for those deliverers. And I go over and look, and it's on the top shelf of delivery under Grubhub. So my thought is, well, obvious mistake. Um, and I get the bag, and then the people who are putting these things on the shelves are right there. So I thought I would alert them to this mistake. Now, I could have 
instead made a scene. How stupid is this? What I wanted was supposed to be over there. You got it on this. What do you imagine that might have accomplished? <laughs> Nothing. Not only would it not have accomplished anything, it would have upset a whole lot of people, including other customers who were just trying to have their dinner in peace. So that kind of explosive complaint not only doesn't solve the problem, it also, if you would, harms a lot of other people there. Now, it's not harm like cutting off somebody's arm, but really, if you go in and literally disturb the peace, that's wrong. It's sin, to use a really short, accurate word. It's not how you treat other people, even people that you don't know in public. So instead, I went to the people behind the counter, and I said, I thought you ought to know that this package, which is supposed to be over there on the pickup shelf, instead it was here under deliveries where it says Grubhub. And the woman behind the counter says, yeah, I know. I can see it easier when it's on that shelf. It's too far to see it over there. And I said, uh, how was I to know that, that it's here instead of there? And she said, well, it's easier for me to see it here. Because then I can tell if somebody's taken it, then, you know, I'll know. And once again, how would I know that? I was told it would be on that shelf over there. Yeah, but here I can see it. And so I clearly wasn't getting through. So I started screaming. No, I didn't. So I <laughs> took the package over to the table where we were sitting walked over to the other side where they make these and said, I'd like to talk to the manager. The manager came out. I described what had just happened because I knew there was a flaw in the process. Uh, and it really wasn't because I wanted to whine. It was because the process wasn't working. And I told her what was happening. She went, oh, ugh. that's so wrong. That's not the process that we've established. Was it such and such a person? And I said, yes. She said, this is the second time this week that she's invented her own process, even though having been corrected, I'm going to give you all your money back. And I said, you don't have to do that. That's not why I came. I just wanted to make you aware of that there was a problem that you would care about because you manage this place. She says, I know, I understand but I both have to make a correction over there and I'm going to give you all of your money back, which she then did. I then later took this example, a description of it, to one of the folks who had just a couple of days earlier done this giant freak out in public where nothing that they wanted to accomplish was accomplished. And I said, this is the strategy that you use in dealing with other people. It is, if you would, how you show love for the creatures of God. Is you don't falsely accuse them. You don't loudly accuse them in public, with some exceptions. And what you instead do is carefully and calmly explain to the person who this most affects what the issue is. And when you do that, nine times out of 10, it's going to accomplish the goal that you've set, in this case, a correction. The other technique, zero times out of 10. It's just a miserable failure. And so if you're thinking about how do I live in the world or how do I live with my mishpocha? That illustration really is spot on. If I have a problem with somebody here, yelling about it in front of others accomplishes only embarrassment for the person with whom I have a problem and hurt and concern for everybody else who's present. This is not healthy healing. 
This is not growth in the spirit of God. Grace is often defined uh, as unmerited favor. I think it's not a bad definition. I think it's much richer and more complex than that uh, and has dimensions of shalom, of peace, of healing, uh, tikkun olam, uh, to restore the world or to heal the world, um, giving grace, either the grace that we receive from God in making us who we are or in the gifting that he gives us, or grace as we demonstrate it to each other. And if you have something going on which is really irritating me, when I show you grace in how I listen and respond, it might well be unmerited favor toward you. It might be that what you're doing is desperately wrong and hurtful. But when my approach is a loving approach, instead of a, an angry, bitter, mutter under your breath, uh, loud and hurtful approach, the unmerited favor which I show you or you show me in similar circumstances, ultimately leads to my growth in spirit and your growth in spirit and gives us each also a better appreciation of the unmerited favor that God has given us, both as individuals and as the body of Christ, the body of Yeshua, Guf HaMashiach in Hebrew. It's a favor we didn't merit, but it is extraordinary in its power. And our praise and thanksgiving for his grace toward us should be extraordinary in response. Thank you, Lord, for blessing each of us with all of the rest of us.